Hi, my name is Patrick Dixon and I'm one of the co-producers of the Labour History Today podcast based in Washington, D.C. Labour History Today is a project of the Kamanovitz Initiative for Labour and the Working Poor at Georgetown University. You better listen, my brother, because if you do, you can hear there are voices still calling from across the years. And they're crying across the ocean. They're crying across the Dear friends, welcome to the Labor Radio Podcast Network profile series highlighting the work of our members. The growing network of over 70 shows in four countries serves as a one-stop shop for audiences looking for labor content, and as a resource for labor broadcasters, podcasters, and content producers. My name is Evan Papp, and I produce Empathy Media Lab's podcast on labor, political economy, arts, and culture. And we're a proud member of the Labor Radio Podcast Network. Well, Patrick, tell me a little bit about yourself, where you grew up, and what led you to organize labor. Okay, certainly. So I'm from a town called Poole, which is in a county called Dorset in the southwest of England. Uh, it's a fairly sort of coastal area and quite rural. And I suppose if I were to describe it, I'd say it's it's really quite beautiful and idyllic in many ways. Um, I'd say the environment in which I sort of went to school and grew up was not necessarily, it's not necessarily a highly intellectual uh, atmosphere but my parents were both high school teachers and union members. And so I suppose that was quite informative in first introducing me to the ideas of unions and how unions worked and how labor worked. And those teachers unions in England, they got a pretty good deal. I think they got a pretty good deal. They got a pretty good deal for my family and many others. We were able to, to travel around Europe. I visited the US a couple of times as a child. That kind of sparked my interest in, in, in what I later did, which was I, I, I pursued a, uh, a PhD in, in US history. Uh, all of that said, what, what interested me in labor, I always found it fascinating working in all sorts of different workplaces. I took my first job when I was 16. Uh, in a like a fast food restaurant, and ever since then I found every opportunity I could almost to try every different job I could find. So I worked in a fast food restaurant. I worked cleaning the toilets in a nightclub. I worked uh, in sort of a housekeeping department, cleaning holiday homes. I had a job driving a van, driving cleaners around. I worked in a box factory. I worked in a printing factory. I worked in a garbage tip. I worked in, um, what was the other one? Um, in, for FedEx and for a bunch of these parcel companies in their warehouses. And one of the things that interested me about these was always, I mean, some of them were really tough jobs. I'm not going to say, like, in, working in a box factory was not fun. It was like a 12 hour shift and you had to be there at 6 a.m. And FedEx, you had to be there at like 4 a.m. and you'd just get cursed at for four hours. But um, I was interested in the politics of every workplace, that there was a sort of dynamic among different workers and the things that people were concerned about and the things that people were interested in. And, you know, it wasn't, there was a politics to it. It wasn't always sort of politics in the grander scale. Um, often people might be interested in or concerned about uh, when they could go and smoke cigarettes and why they weren't allowed to smoke cigarettes as frequently as they'd like to. But, you know, there's a power dynamic in there. Um, or, you know, how the supervisor's talking to them. I mean, there was a, one particular place where there were, I worked one of these warehouses and all of the, all of the hourly guys hated the forklift truck drivers. The idea of forklift truck drivers, they were all, I mean, they were all above us. And so, I, I don't know, I saw a lot of these different dynamics and I learned a lot about different people and I learned about, I don't 
you know, class and work and all of these things. And people taught me things of different types. I, I remember one occasion when I, I was, uh, I had a job and I was, there was like a nightclub and there was this outdoor seating area. And among my jobs was clearing up the tables of the trash when they were gone. And I found a, a wallet on one occasion. So I asked, you know, I must've been like 17 and I asked someone who'd worked there a long, uh, a lot longer than I, what do we do when we find wallets? And he picks up the wallet. He says, we empty it for cash and then we chuck it in the trash. So, well, that's, I didn't sort of incorporate that into my work method subsequently, but I just, you know, found these tidbits interesting in, I always found just interesting learning about the way in which people interacted with their work and interacted with one another at work and uh, how they thought about, how they thought about their jobs. So then you went to school to do this full time and to do research and, and presumably uh, teach as well. So kind of, could you talk a little bit about that uh, path? Certainly, yeah, and you know, I, when I was, I don't know, 23, 24, trying to determine what I was going to write about, I didn't necessarily think, it in, think about it in the way I do now, but I think with over a decade's hindsight, I kind of gravitated toward you know, subjects that I was comfortable with and talking about, you know, it's like, uh, you know, if you want to become an expert in something, you know, you need to try and find a suit that fits. So coming from that kind of rural and not especially intellectual background, the idea that I'd go away and become a historian of diplomatic relations or sort of high level politics or uh, intellectual thought, I I just, I feel like I'd find that uncomfortable if I were to go home and go to the village pub and say that that was what I was an expert in. But I, I particularly ended up focusing on the poultry business and people who worked in chicken factories and kind of the restaurant business and how these were all combined. And again, I don't think that was necessarily something I was conscious of at the time, but you know, thinking about it now, I think, well, if you were to go home and and uh, say, well, you know, a few things or two about hens and about eggs and, you know, that that was kind of the sort of subject that people back home would respect. As opposed, oh, and you wouldn't, you know, there's kind of a, who do you think you are type attitude if you try and, uh, I don't know, I think that's something about lots of cultures, but if you try and, uh, project yourself as being too, uh, I don't know, elite or too educated than people, who does he think he is? So I kind of, you know, I was interested in poultry work and how, um, how in a way this, uh, what I see it as this sort of massive transformation took place in the sort of in the American diet from one that was primarily based on beef to one where poultry was the main protein uh, and you know and, and connecting that to how how regular people worked and how regular people considered food and how people made food a part of their lifestyle but how that connected to the work too and the work of producing chicken and you know as everyone knows um, it's one of the most dangerous jobs there is and remains, continues to be so that was kind of my interest Great. Yeah, that I'd love to see your dissertation uh, sometime. I, I don't know if you published it or not. Uh, well, I'm working on a book, so I, I'd be much more uh, comfortable probably presenting the book when it's done. So I'm, I'm getting there, I think. <laughs> For those who may not be interested or aware of labor news, uh, could you talk a bit to the uninitiated why you think unions and organized labor are important and should be given a platform? I think speaking as someone, speaking as a trained historian, I suppose, when you look at, um, when you look at the history of, of labor relations and the way in which employers have interacted with workers through the course of the 
you know, history of the US, there have been, uh, there have been many sort of models and methods by which employers have interacted with their employees. And there have been many ways in which uh, employers have created internal organizations and methods of trying to appease or trying to please or trying to make employees feel included in uh, included in the included in the process make them feel part of the family uh, until they're fired at least you know it's a family but you can't fire members of your own family but um, but it, it, none of those I feel like has had the same uh, the same long-term sort of structural and economic change within workplaces in terms of being able to provide people with, with safety, uh, with job security, with, uh, you know, with retirement security, uh, as, as unions have. And, you know, not all unions have succeeded in that. And, you know, there's good unions and there's better unions and there's some that aren't so good but um, I think that's to date the most reliable model of uh, empowering workers to s speak out when they say see things that shouldn't be taking place in the workplace and, and, and providing with workers with what they often deserve in their jobs so um, I don't, I'm not sure if there's an area you want me to expand on that. Yeah, I mean, I, I look at unions. I came with a little bit of a different background. Wasn't I didn't grow up in the union movement. My father was in the union. My mother's grandfather was in the union. And uh, the more I started looking at organized labor, I saw it as a counterbalance to a lot of the, the ruling class powers. And so I kind of came into it as a way as seeing a, almost a means to um, support a lot of the the working class and then as i learned more and more about it it's also it's an end in itself it, it provides a greater democratic platform and and protections for the workers to be able to have a dialogue uh, with the management and uh, with the owners that can be a harmony of interest it doesn't have to be a zero-sum game as it's often portrayed and so i i've I kind of came to the realization fairly recently that it's not only a means, but it's also the end in itself. And anything uh, around human um, human development, human uh, building and construction and design can always be improved. So there's always going to be issues, but uh, that's that's kind of my approach um, coming into it. Well, I think, as you say, I mean that sort of model. It doesn't, in terms of it not having to be adversarial i think uh unions employ and employers work very well at bmw and volkswagen and mercedes-benz and audi in germany those companies seem to be doing quite well in entirely unionized workplaces so there are other ways of doing things and uh, that leads me to my next question uh can you talk a bit about the shows you're working on and how you got uh, started in supporting those shows and, and what they're about? I was brought on to help with Labour History Today uh, about two and a half years ago. It was originally envisioned as a kind of round table of Labour historians. And um, I think Chris Garlock, the host, had uh, organised a roundtable of the most well-known Labour historians in the town and some of the better known ones weren't available and then somehow I was next on the list and so I got brought in at some point. And we had some fun doing those roundtable type shows at the uh, AFL-CIO headquarters on 16th Street but after a while it became a little bit repetitive hearing the same voices even if they were talking about different subjects so we started to branch out the show into interviewing people wherever anywhere in mostly in the US occasionally in Canada most we mostly focused on US based content and not uh, not international but um, 
So what the show, I mean, so the show tries to, we, what we often try to do is we try to take historic, we try to take a historical perspective on present events and try to give kind of the backstory of a lot of what's going on. And sometimes it might be something that's very uh, central to the news at the moment, but sometimes we'll pick up on um, perhaps a more obscure story that's under the radar. And a lot of our guests that we interview are historians, but we've also interviewed activists, we've interviewed workers, we've had, uh, we've had discussion of more sort of recent history on sort of contemporary workers, uh, contemporary worker struggle. We've had, we had an organizer from uh, a hamburger restaurant workers union in Seattle. Well, he told us the three year history of their union. I mean, that was history too, I suppose. And so um, in the same way as I described earlier that I was always interested in all these different jobs, I've also tried to introduce through the Labour History Today podcast this kind of window into um, many more obscure prof professions and use it as a sort of platform to discuss and think about uh, think about all sorts of different lines of work. I mean, we've had over, I think we've had about 150 shows already. So there's only so much that pe teachers are fascinating, miners are fascinating, uh, merchant seamen are fascinating, but people don't want to hear about those every week, I think. And so, um, you know, I've tried to, tried to have a very sort of broad and uh, broad and sort of Catholic approach to who counts as a worker. And many of those, many of those episodes have led us to discussions of workers that are outside of unions, but we've had discussions on the work of clowns, uh, the work of rodeo women. Uh, we've had several episodes on uh, different types of sex work, prostitution, uh, uh, sorry, erotic dancing, it's not exotic dancing. Exotic dancing is a bad term. Erotic dancing is an okay term I learned through one of these episodes. Mm -hmm. um, we've... Uh, Flintstones was, uh, case in point, completely unusual, unique angle uh, that I helped uh, do some edit for the, the weekly. Um, I love that one. We did, we did, we did. Um, we got on one occasion, we got um, a gentleman on the phone who was uh, involved in the construction of the uh, gateway arch in St. Louis. And he was somewhat reluctant to tell us many stories, but he did tell us that it was quite windy when they were constructing the gateway arch. So um, we've tried to sort of cover the map and uh, and you use the plat use the podcast as a, a sort of showcase to pre pre present original interviews that we've conducted, but also to to at times show some of the other good content that's also being made by other historical podcasts. So I think you see on Labour History Today. Um, a variety of different voices and normally some some link that connects historical events or labor history of the past with uh, many of the sort of contemporary questions that uh, we find ourselves thinking about at the moment that's kind of the idea i i absolutely love it i've learned a ton from labor history today and i also it gives me a lot of strength because when i think of our struggles and our trials and tribulations of the, the current, uh, current generation, uh, contemporary history. Uh, the, the struggles before, in some ways, are my, my personal struggles and the general struggles with, with all my friends and family and community and citizens and, and world citizens is, is essentially, it may pale in comparison to some of the, the tremendous fighting that past folks have gone through to to give me what I've been given 
and it's this long uh, line of passing the torch and uh, gives me hope as well. And uh, in some of the darkest hours that uh, by through persevering and struggling and solidarity uh, and unifying that struggle, uh, you can actually move the, move the marker forward for progress. Absolutely. I mean, I mean, we've had some of them, some of these stories that we get a remarkable, we interviewed, um, we interviewed workers from the Culinary Workers Union in Las Vegas, and they were on strike in the 90s for about five years. Now, I, I've been to Las Vegas, and it was over, over 100 degrees. They were on strike 24 hours a day for over five, I think it was over five years. So I don't have the specific number or the um, the, the date, but uh, they just kept going. They just kept going and going, and they won in the end. Not everyone always wins, unfortunately. There's a lot of that in labor history too, but um, there's like lessons that we can learn. There's often lessons that we can learn, and we can sort of understand why and what um, what went wrong. So moving on to the next question about the Labor Radio Podcast Network, uh, that's where I first began seeing you on our weekly calls, and mm -hmm. uh, you have a much longer history with Chris Garlock and team. And so as part of the Labor Radio Podcast Network, could you talk about why you think such a network is important? I, I find being part of the labor history, sorry, the, excuse me, I find the Labour Radio Podcast Network, in, in some ways it's, it's kind of amazing knowing or having some familiarity with just about every Labour show, every Labour podcast that, uh, that's taking place in the United States right now. Now, it's not that everyone is necessarily a close participant in the network, but I have the, we have this broad, just sort of sweeping awareness of kind of everything that's going on within this medium. And it's allowed us to connect with all sorts of different people producing all sorts of different shows, really a rich variety of different shows in all sorts of locations. And... I feel like I've gained a lot of technical advice or technical expertise or technical uh, instruction in terms of, you know, the basics of sound recording. But it's also allowed for a lot of collaborative work whereby uh, we've been able to work together with people who produce other shows to 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 to, to present to present uh, to present sort of unified content or to present my sh my material on someone else's show or to use our show as a way to showcase what someone else is doing and to sort of cross promote I think that's um, I think that's been really invaluable and I think um, as you and others have continued to work on it I think. Uh, I think there's a lot of exciting stuff that we can still do uh, as it as it as it continues to develop. That we've done a lot, and we're like six months in. So um, I'm really very sort of optimistic. And and I guess the other thing that I feel about the Labour Radio Podcast Network is that it doesn't just it doesn't just promote and support existing shows but the existence of the of a network like this i i think represents a tool or represents a uh, represents a sort of basis of support which can allow people who haven't created shows to create new shows so i'm hoping that it um encourages and spurs and is able to aid and assist uh, many people who might have an idea about a show that they want to make that nothing like that exists but they just need you know they need uh, they need a little bit of guidance or they need a bit of instruction or 
you know, some moral support, but, you know, I'm optimistic that as a result of this network existing, that it will make it easier for, for other workers or for other activists or for, you know, unions themselves as official entities to, to, produce, uh, to produce new and original content of their own too. And I look forward to hearing that. Absolutely. And I'm, I'm also interested in the expansion uh, internationally as well. I spent uh, a few years in Africa and uh, at least in the, I can understand, you know, the English speaking uh, countries and, and people in those countries. So I'm, I'm looking at that and also in Southeast Asia and some of these other places and, and continue to, to strengthen the solidarity of this network, not just within the US, we already have some shows in the UK, Canada and Brazil, but to continue, continue to grow that as well. So. Where, where were you in Africa? Sorry, I know you were meant to be asking the question. Yeah, no, it's okay. Uh, I was in Zambia for three years. So okay. yeah. Interesting. good old former Rhodesia. Uh, <laughs> oh, that history, yeah. That's, uh... Talk about labor, uh, you know, the, the, the slave labor, you know, couldn't couldn't organize. It, it didn't really have much uh, union representation. So. Right. Well, I don't mean we're here to talk about British colonial history today, but I have a lot of opinions on that subject too. Well, let's let's look to the future and looking into the future of organized labor. Where do you see opportunity and hope? Well, I mean, there are certain things. There's. I've, a bit, I've been asked this by students before, and I say, look, there are certain jobs that you can't ever export. And so there are certain areas like construction, people are always gonna wanna knock things down and build new things. People are always gonna wanna receive education. And so there are certain, uh, I think there are certain fundamental areas of, of core strength that labor needs to maintain. But that said, I think, the challenges that exist today um, really have to sort of focus upon uh, the way in which tech giants have um, have sort of come to dominate our lives. And as we learn more about them and about how they operate, I think we see that you know you don't you don't necessarily relate to Amazon or to Google or these companies as employers and they are employers and they're employers of many people and they're not often very good employers, but they also are able to dominate the way in which we interact with one another. They're able to manipulate our emotions. They're able to manipulate the way in which we absorb news and how we interact with one another. I mean, it's, through using tech that we're able to have this conversation here now. And so uh, I'm interested in ways in not just workers can have a say in, in improving things like workplace and safety in Amazon fulfillment centers, which are desperate needs, but Ways in which, and you know, you look at some of the sort of discontent among, among you know, the, the white collar workers, the sort of trained professionals at companies like Facebook. So ways in which different types of workers can have some sort of a say and perhaps be some sort of a conscience in the way in which uh, we, uh, you know, we as individuals interact with one another through tech, but how the ways in which uh, these extraordinary powerful mediums mediate and uh, control and influence our lives. And so I think that's an area that's desperately in need of a more powerful worker's voice. You better listen, my brother, because if you do, you can hear there are voices still calling from across the years and they're crying across the ocean they're crying across the land and they will until we all come to understand none of us are free none of us are free People 
people in darkness they just can't see the light if we don't say it's wrong then that says it's right we got to feel for each other let our brothers know we're here got to get the message send it out all loud and clear none of us are free Thank you.